Hey, brethren, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker for this hour, Brother Dave Rogers. Brother Rogers grew up in the San Marcos, Texas area and was educated at Austin Community College as well as Southwest Texas State University and also the Victoria College. He began preaching the gospel in 1979 and is a 1980 graduate of the Southwest School of Biblical Studies located in Austin, Texas. Dave and his wife, Luann, recently just celebrated their 36th wedding anniversary, so we wish them a happy anniversary. And they have two married daughters, they have one son, and three grandchildren. He's preached locally in Texas and Oklahoma, where he taught in the uh, Mangum School of Biblical Studies, has participated in many campaigns, including Jamaica, Mexico, and also Northern Ireland. He's now in his fifth year with the Fayetteville Church of Christ in Fayetteville, Georgia, and teaches a number of classes each year in the Georgia School of Preaching, which was just mentioned by Brother Acuff in his prayer. We appreciate the good work that they are doing. His topic for our consideration this hour is earthly words have eternal consequences. And so we're looking forward to that. Brother Dave. Thank you for those kind words, Brother Billy. Thank you to Brother Mosier, the elders here at Memphis for the opportunity to be with you. I have been aware of the lectureship here at Memphis for some 40 plus years, and this is the first opportunity that I have had to actually attend, and so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I have to admit, this is not the first time I've actually been to this building. About 15 years ago, I got to attend Polishing the Pulpit when it was in Huntsville, Alabama, and on my way home from Huntsville following Hurricane Katrina, I had to come this way in order to get gasoline uh, there was just no gas to be had between Huntsville and South Texas in a direct line. So about 11 o'clock one night, as I was coming this away, I thought, you know, I'm going through Memphis. I'm going to at least find that building that I've seen the pictures of. So I guess it was probably 11.30 on a, on a Friday night. I circled through the parking lot and said, well, yeah, I've been to <laughs> Memphis School of Preaching. Not a soul here that I could see. But thank you for letting us be here. We have enjoyed our time here this week immensely. It has been a, a rich blessing to us. And I am so grateful that Brother Rob Whitaker spoke just before me because now we're all wide awake. And I'm thankful for that. If you encounter a tall, ginger-haired fella with a funny accent in the hallways or in here somewhere, uh, take a moment and speak to him listen to him. His name is Graham McDonald. He talks funny because he's from Scotland. He does a very creditable uh, southern drawl, and he'll probably do that for you if you ask. You need to hear about the work that he's doing just outside of Edinburgh. Take advantage of the opportunity to get acquainted with him. My Heavenly Father is so constantly, so consistently good and patient, not just with me, but with all of us. How could I ever say anything critical or derogatory about him? My privilege as a preacher is to touch eternity with his word. Words mean things. They're the main way that we communicate. I have the privilege in the Georgia School of Preaching of teaching from time to time a class that we call Introduction to Research and Composition. Now, among the teachers, we sort of jokingly refer to it as English 1301, but it's so much more than that because it focuses on communication. Words are how we communicate. Words are how we express what we call abstract concepts. And that's why 
God revealed himself to us using words. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verses 9 through 13. There are a lot of people who seemingly are obsessed with words. I'm going to put this up here where I can see it because I just realized I can't see it down there. A lot of people who are seemingly obsessed, not just with words, but with the intentions behind words. Whether they're spoken or printed seems to make no difference. Have you ever known somebody who just knows what you're thinking, even though you haven't told them? They've heard a word or two, maybe they've read something you wrote, and they know what's in your mind, even though you haven't told them. Some of you've had the experience on Facebook or Twitter or some of those other social media sites of having to, to back up after you've posted something, after you've tweeted something, and explain, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what I meant by what I said. How many times have you written or said something that has come back to bite you? If you're a married man. How many times in the course of a day do we backpedal and explain, well, that's not what I meant. Words mean things. Whenever the Pharisees, and let's just make a, a, a note here. When we talk about the Jews, when we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we need to make it plain that in the context of Jesus' encounters with them, we're not talking about all Jews. We're talking about a select portion, the leadership, the religious leaders, the political leaders, the powers, the movers and the shakers as they were, not the common folks. The scripture says the common folks heard him gladly. But whenever the Pharisees tried to catch Jesus in his words, as they did in passages like Mark chapter 12 and verse 13, they tried to twist what he said. They tried to read into his words what they wanted to be there, not what he'd put there. They never tried to deal with him even-handedly fairly, simply, honestly, because their objective was to discredit him, to silence his teaching so that the people would not follow him. In Matthew chapter 12, in the, the text for our lesson this afternoon, in verses 35 and 36 and 37, Jesus gives what really, if you think about it, is one of the most intimidating statements, one of the most intimidating teachings that you'll find in all of New Testament Scripture because he warns those who were hearing him, and by extension all of us, that the things that they were saying, the things that we say, are important. They matter, even when we don't think so. Even when we're speaking off the cuff. Even when we're speaking offhandedly, just off the tops of our heads, as they say, they matter because God pays attention when we speak, even if we don't. And the point that Jesus makes to the Pharisees and to the crowd that followed them and to us is that the things that we say here, earthly words, have eternal consequences. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by the words, by thy words, thou shalt be justified, and by thy words, thou shalt be condemned. Let's begin by looking at the context 
of Jesus' words about words. Let's look at the context of, of what he's saying here. And to do this, really, we need to go back in Matthew chapter 12, at least to verse 22, and, and really to get the setting of it all the way back to verse 14 and consider the motive that he mentioned there. And here again, we find that the circumstance is that the Pharisees, the rulers of the Jews, the political and spiritual movers and shakers, were really trying to find some way to destroy him. They took counsel among themselves, verse 14, how they might destroy him, how they might entangle him in his words, how they might silence him. Verses 22 and 23, what do we learn? We see why it was that they were so bitterly opposed to Jesus, why they wanted to silence him. They understood what the people, the common folks, were saying. They're watching what he's doing. They're listening to what he's saying. They're seeing the miracles he's performing. And they're speaking one to another, talking among themselves. Could this be? Could, could this be? Do you suppose he might be? Now these are people who were looking for a Messiah. Historically, they'd already had several would-be messiahs. There were others who would follow after Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. They knew the Old Testament scriptures. They understood that the time was ripe. They were looking. And so they're saying one to another, do, do you suppose this could be the, the Messiah that we've been looking for? Boy, he meets this this possible qualification and this one. He's doing these miracles, these signs. What, what was it Nicodemus said to him? Good teacher, we know thou art come from God because no man can do the things thou doest except God be with him. They understood. And the Pharisees did too. And they understood, verse 23, that if the people listened to him, it might very well spell the end of their power. The end of their influence. The end of their chosen position at the head of the people. And furthermore, you get down to verses 33 and 34, and in their interaction with him, what does Jesus do? <laughs> he doesn't do what so many of us would and, and, and back off and ease off and say, now wait a minute, hold on, I, I, I don't want to offend you. I'm not trying to upset you. I, I don't want to get you out of your comfort zone. He'd laid down a challenge to them. A challenge they couldn't afford to ignore. Look at the words of verses 33 and 34. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. Be consistent, in other words. Be who you are. Don't be two-faced. Don't be play actors, hypocrites, portraying a role that you don't believe or feel. Be consistent. Oh, generation of viper, you bunch of poisonous snakes. How do you suppose Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or some of those folks would react to being called poisonous snakes to their faces? I think they might get a little bit excited. But that's exactly what Jesus said. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you? Oh, here we go. He's, gonna, he's going to judge them. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now notice what he said in 35 that we read a moment ago. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. A good man's consistent. So is a bad man. Just in a different way. These were words that indicted these people, that indicted these rulers, these Pharisees. It indicted them for having failed to make the tree good. What Jesus says here basically parallels what he said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 and 20. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? By their fruits you'll know them. I have a plum tree at the head of my driveway in my yard in Fayetteville. You know how I know it's a plum tree? It has plums on it. I didn't know what kind of tree it was when I bought the house. But it began to drop plums all over my son's pickup, and I figured it out right quick. These people were angry at what Jesus said. They hated him because they understood exactly what he was, 
was saying to them, exactly what he was telling them, and they didn't want to change. See, here's the problem that we sometimes run into. We don't want to change. Brother Rob was talking about personal evangelism, and one of the headaches we do bump into sometimes is what? We don't want to change. We don't want to get off, off the fence rail. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone. These people didn't want to get out of their comfort zone in their world. It was much easier for them to smear Jesus. Why? He's demon possessed. He's doing this by the power of Beelzebub. Oh, it was easier to do that than it was to repent and accept that Jesus was speaking the truth. We need to destroy him. Now look at three very important words here. In this context of Matthew 12, 35 and 36 and 37, there are three standout words or phrases. And word number one is the word every. The Greek word is pan. It's a common word. And it means all, every kind of something. Nothing is left out. If I were to say every person in this auditorium must leave, who would be excluded? That would include me, wouldn't it? Every one of us, no exceptions. But then the next word, word number two, is the word idle. And that's the Greek word argu, and it literally means unemployed. And it describes actually something that's useless, something that's unprofitable. And it's in this context, it describes something that, that has no careful thought. No consideration. Remember when you were little and your mother used to warn you, think before you speak? What was she telling you? Don't use idle, useless words. Let's think about the implications of these two words. First, we need to see that what this means, what Jesus says here, Every idle word that men shall speak means that there's no such thing as words that don't count with God. There's no such thing as words that God doesn't hear, that God doesn't pay attention to, that God doesn't take account of. Notice in, in King David's day, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 19, in verses 13 and 14, he writes there, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Have you ever sinned presumptuously by something you said? Have you ever spoken out of turn, spoken in a way that, that was not compatible with a faithful Christian's manner of speech? I remember hearing a story illustrating how little pitchers have big ears. Small children hear everything that their parents say and repeat it. Now, my wife can tell you about this, talking to a little girl in a Bible class about 30 years ago where the little girl told her everything that mom and daddy were fighting about the night before. and She's kind of sitting here going, I don't want to hear this. But the story is of a young mother driving through traffic and someone whips out and cuts her off and she has to stand on the brakes and just grind her teeth, stupid jerk. And in the back seat, in the car seat, she hears, stupid jerk. Well, have you ever spoken foolishly like that presumptuously with what you say how well do you keep track of what you say or maybe what you post through the day you ever have to retract what you say the apostle Paul warned in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 that as Christians we should let no corrupt Communication, no corrupt speech proceed out of our mouths, but only what is good for edifying so that it might minister grace to the hearers. Have you ever said something that did not serve grace to those who heard it? 
Yes. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I expect we'd all, if we're over about age nine, have to say yes. How do we think that uh, word idle applies here? Every idle word. What do you think of when you hear that word? Are you thinking about, well, that, that means profane words. That means curse words. I ought not to use naughty words. Socially, well, you can't say socially unacceptable anymore. They're on broadcast television. The word actually describes something that's rotten. Last year, the gardeners at the private school where my wife works dug up all of their flower beds after the tulips had bloomed. It's an expensive school. They have to always have something blooming. So they dug up all the tulip bulbs and were going to throw them away. And my wife said, can I have some? She thought I needed a job, I guess. So we got out there and she showed me where she wanted to put them. And I dug a little trench and I buried the bulbs. And this spring, guess what? They came up. Oh, we're going to have tulips in our yard. And then the deer found them and nibbled them right back down to the ground. <laughs> But you know, they make this wonderful stuff that you can buy in the, in, the, in the big box lawn and garden stores that you sprinkle on flowers to keep the deer and the rabbits away. You know what's in it, Brother Keith? Dried up rotten eggs. And I promise you, it's exactly what it smells like. It, it seems that deer and rabbits don't like rotten eggs. And so those tulips are about that tall now. And they've stayed away so far. We'll see if it works until they bloom. But that's what that word idle describes. Something that's rotten. Something you wouldn't want to touch. Something that's useless. What does that mean for things like, like, like comments that really are nothing but gossip? What was it that Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15? Christians ought not to be guilty of being busybodies. Telling and sharing things we ought not. What does this say about vows and promises that we make without any intention of keeping them? The prophet Nahum in the Old Testament in a passage that anticipates the coming of the Messiah actually says in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of them that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. Now, Paul would later reference this in the New Testament, but notice what follows this in Nahum chapter 1. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee, he's utterly cut off. What about other things that maybe we ought not say? Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 the Apostle Peter tells us that Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he was ill spoken of, falsely charged, accused, did not speak in the same vein. When he suffered, he threatened not, committed himself to him who judges righteously. You think about what Jesus said here. Every idle word that takes in a lot of territory, doesn't it, Brother John? That covers a lot of ground. What we say, what we post, just answer in your own mind. Are your words idle or are they deliberate? But now these thoughts, I haven't forgotten that third word. These thoughts take us to that third term, which is to give account. Jesus gave this warning in Matthew chapter 12. Because judgment's coming. It's that simple. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming for every one of us. There are no exceptions. Why do we seek to persuade men? Because judgment's coming. Why do we preach the gospel? Because judgment's coming. Why do we live uprightly before God? Because judgment's coming. Why do we need to be Christians and even care about these things? Because judgment's coming. And what did Jesus say? Every idle word, you'll give account thereof. 
And that expression, that term, to give account, literally means to repay, like you'd pay a mortgage or pay a car payment. You know what happens if you stop making your car payment, Brother Jay? <laughs> You're going to lose the car. Do you really want your soul repoed because of something you said? Jesus says our words will either justify us or condemn us. It's your choice. These words in, in verse 37, by your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. Those words mean that you'll either be freed or you'll be pronounced guilty. There is no nolo contendere plea in the judgment day. Too many folks, though, seem to think they're going to be able to plead out on the judgment day. Oh, Lord, I'll plead to a lesser charge. <laughs> that doesn't work. Sin is sin is sin is sin. Sin is transgression of the law. All sin bears the same penalty. That doesn't do you any good to plead to a lesser charge. But what about the folks that think they're going to be able to argue out? You ever noticed what's missing in every single biblical account of the judgment? Argument. Oh, we know in, 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 Matthew, uh, in Matthew 25, Jesus says, some will say, well, didn't we do, didn't we do, didn't we do? How much good did that argument do them? Depart. Go away. I never knew you. How many of us, how many of us at the judgment may be sent away into outer darkness, weeping, grinding our teeth, wailing, but I didn't mean it. Precisely because judgment's coming, there are words that we as Christians absolutely must speak in order to be ready for that day. Precisely because judgment is coming, there are words that we must speak in the course of becoming Christians that are absolutely essential to be ready for that day. Like Ezekiel, as children of God, we're supposed to be watchmen to the world around us. Ezekiel chapters 3 and 33, passages familiar to all of these students. But the words that we must speak would include the pure, simple message of the gospel of salvation. What was it that Jesus told his disciples to do? You know the words of Mark 16, 16 just as well as I. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. To every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You can jump over to Acts chapter 2, if you like, to the day of Pentecost. The question, men and brethren, what must we do? And what did Peter and the apostles tell them? Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You need to do these things. We must speak these words. Souls hang in the balance. Paul called these words of truth and soberness over in Acts chapter 26, verse 25. They're sensible things to say, even though the world around us says, I don't want to hear that mumbo-jumbo superstitious nonsense. It's none of those things. But there are also words of warning that need to be spoken. Words of warning to erring saints. What was it James said in James 5 and verse 19 about saving a soul from death and covering a multitude of sins? Who's he talking about there? That includes erring saints. I appreciate so much what Brother John DeBerry said the other night about folks accepting God's word or refusing to accept God's word in comparison to Jesus accepting his plan. What was it Jesus said in Luke 22 and verse 42? We know those words. If there's any other way, let's do it some other way. But Father, not my will, but thine be done. And how many people in our world today, 
Christian and non-Christian alike, depending on the subject at hand, want to say, Father, not thy will, but mine be done, rather than admit their own sins in order to keep their salvation. Even words of submission sometimes are essential. Essential. Because judgment's coming. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 5, we have an example of submission, of putting our judgment aside. Peter, the disciples are out fishing. Jesus says, let down the net. And Peter says, we fished all night and we didn't catch anything, Lord. He could have just as well said, now, I'll I, I tell you what, I know you're a great preacher, Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm a professional fisherman. I'll leave the preaching to you and you leave the fishing to me. I know what this is all about. But what did he say? Lord, we fished all night and caught nothing. But nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the nets for a, dry, a draft. And they like to sink the boat trying to get all the fish back to shore. Sometimes we have to submit. We have to surrender our words, as it were. You flip the pages of the New Testament, you come to the last chapter, the last page of the book of Hebrews, and almost the very last verse, and what instruction does the Hebrews writer give us there in Hebrews 13 and verse 17? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit unto them, for they watch in behalf of your souls as those who must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with sorrow, not with grief. Sometimes, because judgment's coming, I need to set aside what I want, what I think, what I would say in favor of those whom the Lord has set over me and submit to them. All of these words can have eternal consequences, but only you, individually, only we as individuals can decide if there'll be eternally good consequences or eternally horrible. Too often, too often we undervalue the impact of our own words. I remember one time a brother saying to me of, of a comment by a, a fellow preacher years and years ago. Someone was trying to compliment him for having preached a good sermon and he was uncomfortable with that and he just kind of tried to deflect it and play it off and he said oh well that's just one of those 10 cent sermons and the man said I was offended by what he said because what he had preached really touched me but then what he said about it his own estimation of it took away all of the good that he had done he undervalued the impact of his own words and how tragic that they happen to be the words of the gospel in that instance. We know, for example, that Andrew seemingly, surely there's more to the story, but we know that seemingly Andrew only made one convert. In John chapter 1, we read in verses 40 through 42, Andrew went and found his brother and said, we found the Messiah. If he only made one convert, so what? Look who it was! It was Peter. Go over to Acts chapter 8. Come all the way down through Philip teaching the Ethiopian treasurer of Queen Candace, that nobleman. And we get to verse 39. He has been baptized and now he goes on his way rejoicing. Maybe he had a driver with him too. I suppose maybe he did because they were studying as they were riding along in the chariot. But this man now has the privilege of taking the gospel to Africa by himself. I wonder what kind of impact he had. Here's the point of 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. The thing that's being carried out in the school work being done here. Committing to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What would happen if every child of God taught simply one other person? <laughs> Have mercy. we double the number of Christians in the world almost overnight, wouldn't we? Just as 
fitly spoken words can point lost souls toward heaven and should be spoken for that purpose. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 11. Uncertain sounds, the, the opposite of that in the scriptures, can have eternal consequences in hell. And that's the point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in verses 8 and 9. Therefore, don't waste the precious gift of speech with uncertain sounds. Don't be vague. Don't be oblique. Don't beat around the bush when it comes to the gospel. You go over to Genesis chapter 3 and you read about Mother Eve encountering the serpent, the embodiment of Satan in the garden. And he accurately repeated the words of God's law, except for what? All he did was add one word. He could have spoken truth with simplicity and sincerity, but he didn't. He added one word. Eve believed him. And we live with the consequences of a lie and will until time is no more. Do not let your tongue set fire to your eternal destiny, James 3, verses 5 and 6. Now, since our words can affect eternity, since, as the screen says, earthly words do have eternal consequences, we need to make sure that we build our hopes on things eternal. And what that means with respect to our words is that we need to recognize, we need to understand and appreciate what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, when he said, life and death are in the power of the tongue. They really are. We can determine our destiny in eternity with our words. Jesus made the observation in Matthew 15 and verse 11 that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. And we think of that in its context generally in a, in a, in a very physical way. But our words, the words that come out of us are very often a reflection of what's within us. And they have the ability to defile us as well. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7 tells us that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And Paul pointed out in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, that only we, and the Lord, but in this world only we know what's in our minds, what's in our hearts, what's in our thoughts, unless we speak. There are a lot of things in our minds that need not be spoken, that may need to be repented of. But they need not be spoken. Jesus shows us here that the basic core values of our lives are put on public display by the words that we speak. And you see, that's really the point, the context of Matthew 12 and verse 35. The good person brings forth good out of a good heart. The evil person brings forth evil out of an evil heart. That person's core values are right out there for everybody to see. There used to be a series of Capital One credit card ads that the tagline, all these different characters would go through all their ridiculous machinations and they'd get right down to the end of it and they'd ask, what's in your wallet? Well, let's just borrow that line and modify it slightly and ask this question. What's in your heart? Because what's in your mouth is going to tell the whole wide world. Our words have the potential to commend or to condemn us. The Bible, God's word repeatedly warns us to guard our speech. And the most important words spoken on earth by any person in any land in any age have to do with eternity. And it may well be 
as you examine yourself, you find that you need to speak some of them today. And we'd encourage you to do that. Brother, do I have any time? I think that's it. That's good, because I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you.